Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to TPM. Today was a nice day out, so I made it to the range, did a little shooting. I brought the Voodoo 22 out because I have an NRL 22 match tomorrow, so I wanted to reconfirm my dope. I shot from 25 yards out to 300 yards, and I actually shot a 1.26 inch five shot group at 200 yards in the wind with that rifle. It just amazes me that a rimfire is capable of doing stuff like that. And I'm super excited for the match, so hopefully I shoot well tomorrow because the rifle is dialed in and I have no excuses now. So enough of that. The topic today is something that was brought up by a viewer a couple weeks ago. He asked what were five things that I thought should be focused on during your reloading practices to improve your accuracy and consistency, which I thought was a great topic. There's a ton of things out there. I just picked the top five that came to mind. This isn't the end all be all list, but we'll get right into it and we'll go through each one and kind of talk about them. So let's get started. All right, guys, have my list here. The five topics I'm about to go over, they are not in any specific order. There are topics in here and things that are more important than others, but I'll let you guys decide that. In fact, if you have any sort of other things that we should look at in reloading to improve accuracy or consistency that's not mentioned on these, this list, feel free to leave in the comments section and maybe we'll address that in a future video. But the first thing I have written on here is consistency and documentation. So accuracy in precision rifle reloading is all about consistency, I can tell you that. It doesn't matter if you have an accurate load one day and you change your reloading practice up and you still have an accurate load, something is gonna change in there, whether it be the velocity or some other aspect of your uh, external ballistics, but consistency and documentation is very important. I had a video about uh, a month and a half ago where we went over a form that I use and it's available for download on the website, but it goes over some very basic stuff and that's just what it is. It's very basic stuff that I take to the range with me and I use to jot down notes and whatnot, but back here in the shop where I do my reloading, I have a lot more detailed notes on my reloads. So everything from how many times the brass has been fired to my neck sizing dimension, which bushing I'm using, uh, how many times I've annealed the brass, how many times it's been fired. So all those details are super critical for having a consistent ammunition across the field and over time. So very important guys, accuracy is all about consistency and vice versa. So document, document, document. You will appreciate that in the long run. All right, we have number two here, and I actually laughed a little bit when I wrote this down because I was thinking back to my early days of reloading when my reloading practices were just absolutely horrible. And for whatever reason, I still had decent shooting ammo. I don't know how. I didn't shoot as much long range back then, but just horrible compared to what they are now. So the topic is accurate powder charges. Thinking back to the beginning again, my powder charges might have been accurate to 200 thousandths of a grain, so 0.2, plus or minus. So actually 400 thousandths of a grain, which is a huge, huge spread in powder charge. And now I try to keep them accurate to 0.02. And that's just on the plus side, I usually don't go below my target. So pretty big difference there. And I've basically changed my ways of reloading and evolved to where I am today. And that's based on the experience that I've got in shooting these rounds over a chronograph and shooting them at distance. You can really see the effect that inaccurate and uh, inconsistent powder charges has have on your rounds, especially when you get out to 500 yards and beyond. If you're shooting at primarily 100 yards and stuff close like that, you might not see a big difference. In fact, I've shot a bunch of ladder tests and OCW tests at 100 yards where you can have a powder charge spanning from, let's say 80 grains all the way up to 84 grains, so four full grains of powder, and not see a whole lot of difference in your point of impact on the target. They might all be sub MOA at 100 yards. However, you do that at 500 yards or 1,000 yards, then you're gonna have a huge, huge vertical fluctuation in where those rounds are impacting. So be as accurate as you can be with your powder charges you'll appreciate it in the long run with consistency and better accuracy. All right guys, number three, this might catch a little flack in the comments section. You might be adamantly against this or for this. Either way, let me know in the comments section what you think, if you have any experience with this or have noticed this in other reloaders. But the topic is don't chase speed. And 
This is something I've noticed in a lot of new reloaders out there. They have an unrealistic goal for their rifle or their cartridge and they do everything they can, including throw out all the safety practices that we do when we're reloading. They don't care, they just wanna make it to that velocity for whatever reason. I can tell you from experience that a steel target or an animal doesn't care if it's hit by a round going 2,600 feet per second or 2,800 feet per second. It doesn't matter. If you want a faster cartridge, go buy a faster cartridge. Don't try, try and make the one that you have shoot out of its comfort zone. So don't try to overpressure your rounds. You're gonna run into issues with your case life, your safety, um, a whole bunch of other things that that can really, really affect. So find something that's reasonable. And generally when I'm doing my load development using the OCW method, I will find two different nodes. And one of them is usually right up there at the ragged edge of high pressure. And one of them's kind of further back, maybe 100 feet per second lower. And you'll get a lot better accuracy, life out of your cases and consistency out of that lower accuracy node. So something to think about. I try not to push the ragged edge on pressure, it's unsafe and if you ever change environments like I do, I'll go from zero degrees all the way to 110 degrees and no matter what powder you're using, if it's the reloader stuff or even the hydrogen extreme powders, you're going to see a temperature variance going from one climate to another like that. And I, I just simply don't have the time to reload specific rounds for winter and then specific rounds for summer. It just doesn't work like that. So I find something that has moderate pressure and it works for all the different conditions for me. So that's kind of a safety thing, but it's also a consistency and accuracy, accuracy thing as well. So again, let me know if you have any experience with that in the comment section, I'd be really interested to hear. All right, moving right along to number four, we have consistent neck tension. This is another one of those things that's evolved for me. I used to reload with those dies that had the preset neck tension and they sized the body in, the, in the, the same shot. I have no idea if I was shooting 2,000 neck tension or 8,000 of neck tension, but they shot and they were fairly accurate for me, so that's what I did. Now I really keep track of that and I dial it into within a half of a thousandth of an inch. And depending on what I'm shooting, if it's a match rifle, I usually run one to one and a half thousand of tension and hunting rifle is usually two to two and a half. So there's a couple ways we can control that and make sure that we're consistent because that's the key is consistency here. It doesn't matter if you're running one thousandth or five thousandths of neck tension. Just make sure it's consistent from case to case that you're reloading for your rifle. First of all, using uh, neck bushing dies or the sizing dies that will allow you to interchange those little bushings that constrict the neck down when you're, you're sizing your brass. That's very helpful because you can dial it in once again, very, very fine to whatever bullet you're using, the thickness of the necks of the brass that you're using, your specific rifle, all these things. Another way we can do this is bench resters are very familiar with this is neck turning. So they'll take brand new brass or brass that's nice and soft and they'll expand the necks to a known diameter on the inside and the outside diameter they take and they turn it and they cut it down so you have a consistent wall thickness of all the necks of your brass. I don't do that, it's very time consuming. It is something you only have to do once generally and like I said, the bench resters are very good at doing this and that's how they maintain consistent neck tension throughout all the brass that they reload. And another thing we can do to maintain good, consistent neck tension is by regularly annealing our brass. So we're not gonna get too deep into the weeds on annealing in this video because we've talked about it in the past, but kind of a quick and dirty rundown of what happens is we shoot a rifle, the brass expands to fit the chamber, we take it out, we throw it in the reloading press, and we size it back down, shrink the dimension back down so we can shoot it again. So. Each cycle of this leads to more and more work hardening of the brass, which makes it more and more springy. So ultimately what we want is have soft brass that has less spring back. So when we size it, it maintains that dimension as closely as possible. So you have consistency straight across the board. And consistency is what we are looking for, especially with our neck tension. So you're gonna have to determine how often you anneal your brass. There's some brass that I have that I don't anneal until it hits four or five firings and there's other brass that I anneal every time that I shoot it. So it just kind of depends on the cartridge and you have to kind of see 
what happens during the reloading process. So again, documentation and taking measurements of how the brass reacts every time it's fired. And that can help you determine what your annealing cycles are gonna be. The method that I use to maintain consistent neck tension is something I've talked about in the reloading videos, but I'll go over it real quick. So for this example, let's use a 308 and let's say that I want to get two thousandths of neck tension on that case. So what I'll do is I'll take my case and I'll oversize the neck and use a three thousandths neck tension bushing to size the neck and constrict it smaller than what I want. From there, I'll take an expanding mandrel that is size to the exact neck tension that I want. So it's two thousandths under 308, which makes it 0 0.306. And I'll run that through the necks of my cases. That expands them up to that known dimension and I have consistent neck tension that way. So it's important to know that we talked about brass spring back and work hardening and stuff before, but you have to have nicely and regularly annealed brass in order for this to be effective and consistent. So it goes back to annealing and how all this plays into having consistent neck tension and better accuracy downrange. All right, last but not least, we have number five, which is finding the correct seating depth for your rifle. We talked about this a couple weeks ago in a video I put out that went over three different methods you can use to find your initial seating depth for low development. But let's just say that seating depth is a very easy way to manipulate the accuracy and consistency of your loaded rounds. It's the primary way that I dial in the accuracy of my cartridge after I run through a whole load development test. So I'll do a full OCW test and I'll take that powder charge and I'll load a series of rounds up with different seating depths in generally like five to 10,000 increments from at the land, so zero jump or jam, all the way to 100 thousandths off the land, so 100 thousandths of jump. And then I'll fine tune it after I find the, the sweet spot there and I'll keep fine tuning the uh, distance from the lands until I find exactly where I wanna be. And it's very effective. I'd have to say if I put a numerical value to how effective it was, I probably get on average anywhere from 30 to 50% group size reduction by just going through a seating depth test like that. So it's a great way to fine tune your ammo. If you're loading your ammo to a known spec, let's say the overall dimension in a manual or something like that, you're doing yourself a huge disservice and you're leaving a lot of accuracy and consistency on the table because that round is not truly tailored for your rifle. And honestly, that's the whole point of uh, metallic cartridge reloading in my my opinion. So if you want to go out and load uh, ammo that you can bang steel with at close range, that's one thing, then all of this can be thrown out the window. But for the purpose of this video and what I focus on, which is precision rifle shooting, we want to take every sort of variable that we can control and make sure it's as accurate and consistent as possible. And seating depth is one of those things that we can easily control. The tools don't cost a lot. If you do it using one of those methods that I showed you, all it's gonna cost you is a Sharpie and you can really dial in your reloads that way. So get on that if you're not doing that now and you'll see a huge difference. So I know when I started doing this, back in the day I was loading to book spec and now obviously I don't do that and I can't even fathom what I was leaving on the table as far as accuracy back in the day. And that does it for today guys, thanks for tuning in. And thank you once again to the gentleman who gave me the idea for this topic. I think this was a great thing to talk about and hopefully that got some good information out there, especially for the new reloaders who are kind of maybe hitting their head against a brick wall trying to improve their accuracy and they're not exactly sure which route to take. But again, this is just my opinion. These are things that work for me and they probably work for a lot of you guys too. But that being said, I'd love to hear from some of you guys in the comments section if you agree with these or if you disagree or you have others that you'd like to add to this list. But this is all interesting stuff and let's keep the dialogue going in the comments section. And thank you guys once again for the support. Thanks for watching and have a good weekend. We'll see you next time.